If we haven't met, my name's Eric. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you so much for choosing to come out and worship with us today. What an honor it is to preach God's word. Today, I aim to be an equal opportunity offender. So I pray at some point during the message, you're going to be mad at me, but hey, that is absolutely okay, especially if you're mad because of what God's word says and not because of any opinion that I might offer up. Amen? So... Ecclesiastes 3 reminds us that there is a time and a season for all things. It says there's a time to plant and a time to reap, a time to build and a time to tear down, a time to mourn and a time to heal. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, during the height of the Great Depression, leading into World War II, said the following, there is a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations, much is given. Of other generations, much is expected. This generation has a rendezvous with destiny. So today, I hope to answer a couple of questions. Does life really happen in cycles? If so, what does the Bible call those cycles? Are we living in a generation to where much is given? Or maybe a generation where much is expected? Does the generation in which we live in right now have a rendezvous with destiny? I think we do. Why don't we pray and explore what God has to say? Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory today. Thank you for this fabulous time in your presence, worshiping you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, lifting hands with fellow believers in Jesus Christ, declaring that you are King of the universe, for you are Today, Holy Spirit, would you speak through me? Would you give those who are listening eyes to see, ears to hear, and most importantly, the power to put your word into practice in their everyday lives? Lord, we thank you. Speak to us, your saints today, and call us to go out and live our lives to make a difference in the lives of others. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to share a couple of natural analogies to start, but I would ask you right from the beginning to be thinking of spiritual analogies even as I share these things in the natural. Mary Jo has been on a roll lately. I mean, she has been planting stuff in the yard. She's created an amazing garden out there. I mean, she is out there in that 100 degree heat going out there and digging in the ground. I am like in awe of her. The yard is really looking absolutely amazing. I'm like, honey, but what in the heck are you doing so aggressively going out there and trying to get all this stuff done? I don't understand. And then she started to fill me in on how things work in the plant world. So if you want your plant to survive the winter season that is to come, is anybody ready for winter? I mean, I am ready for winter. out there. But if you want your plants to survive the winter season, then guess what? You better get them in the ground now. You better get the roots going deep. You better get them going solid. This is the time to make sure that your plants are healthy and ready because in everybody's life, guess what? Winter one day comes. Do you believe that? Winter comes. There are seasons to our life and seasons to the generations that we find ourselves in and the generations in which we live. Let me give you another natural example. If you roll the clock back just a little bit to around 2006, 2007, houses were selling like wildfire. I mean, house prices were going through the roof. Everybody and their brother was out there flipping houses. Everybody and their brother was becoming realtors. And then guess what? In 2008, everything crashed, right? So if you didn't understand or discern the times and you became a realtor right at the cusp of 2007, guess what probably happened to your career in 2008? Gone, right? It's important in life and in the spirit that we understand the season in which we find ourselves in. Because if you go all in in the wrong season, then some bad things happen. You can get kind of wrecked, amen? So what season do we find ourselves in? The Bible does describe life much like seasons. We talked about it from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 just a moment ago, does it not? 
If you think of the human life and the human lifespan, roughly 80 years for the most part, right? When you're young, you're in that spring season, you're born, you're growing up. It's an exciting time to be alive. Where did all the young people go? They run out of here after this thing. There's, we ran them off. They're all in the lobby up there, <laughs> except for Davin. We'll keep Davin. But right, you're young, you're willing to do stuff like that. You're excited, you start to go out of your 20s and into your 30s and you enter the summer years of life. Things are still good. You're still willing to go out there at the beach. Everything still looks good when you're out there at the beach. Come on, Jesus, right? You start to enter into your like 50s and then you're entering into the autumn of your life. A little bit older, we're entering into the winter of our life, that, that later season. You know, yesterday my dad turned 85. I was so excited for him. It was his birthday, 85 years old, still really going strong. So excited for him at this phase of his life, right? But generations also have a spring, summer, winter, and fall. One of the modern day secular theories is called the fourth turning. It's a pretty interesting concept, but it really makes sense. It goes along with the seasons scripturally, which I would espouse to you that scripture describes as something called birth pangs, right? And it says, as those birth pangs continue to increase all the way up until the day that the Lord would return. So let's take a brief look at American history for just a moment and talk for a second about what that looked like. So uh, America had found itself in a bit of a winter season right at its birth, right? In the 1770s, the uh, British were in control of the United States, and we didn't like things like taxation without representation. There were other things that Britain was putting upon us, and America rebelled against the authorities that were over them, and then we ended up prevailing in that war that occurred. The winter season left, and there was this young, budding country that was coming to fruition, it was not a perfect country by any means, but it's become the great superpower that it finds itself to be in our generation, right? So there were hidden cracks and pains that were there behind the scenes that ultimately led up to a, another winter season called the Civil War, right? How many of you are old enough to remember the Civil War? No, nobody, no, right? Come on. But we don't even think about these things. Our generation has generally forgot about some of those things, right? We don't think about the Civil War. It's distant past for us, but there's important things to continue to learn, right? So during the Civil War, they overcame a great evil and began the end of slavery, right? That was an important moment in American history. Was it perfect? By no means, right? There were still issues, there were still challenges. The next major, major crisis season, the next winter season that America faced was none other than the Great Depression and World War II, right? That was a big birth pang on the global scene. It was a worldwide event that affected everybody and America came out of that the victor yet again, did we not, right? And out of that, what was that generation that called? Does anybody know what the generation coming out of World War II was called? Boomers. What was it? Boomers. Bo boomers? Yeah, boomers. That's, that's a good one. But at the same time, the generation that came out was called the greatest generation. Those who fought that war were called the greatest generation. So we're defined by words, like he said, the baby boomers were shortly thereafter the greatest generation, and then generation X, right? And then the millennials, and then generation Z. So we're encapsulated in some ways by the age group in which we came in. That's the season of life into which we were born both naturally and spiritually. Now spiritually start to flip the script. If the Bible talks of these things called birth pangs, that they would increase, and after a winter season, hopefully there's a good spring season, right? You want that new life, you want something good. So one of the amazing things that was birthed out of World War II was the rebirth of the nation of Israel. A prophetic rebirth. No nation had ever gone away in the history of mankind, yet the Bible predicted that the Jewish nation, which would be gone for some close to 2,000 years, would rise again in the end days, that people would come from the north, the south, the east, and the west, they would begin to return to this small little sliver of land called Israel, and it happened. No language had ever gone away and became the nation, uh, the, the language of a nation ever again in the history of the world. It's a prophetic miracle that occurred during that spring season. There's some other things that the Bible says. 
It actually says, this generation shall not pass away that sees that event happening before the coming of the Lord. That's kind of a crazy thing to think about. What if that is true? Come on, Jesus. That means we could be approaching another winter season, another birth pang that would usher in the very return of the Lord Jesus Christ. How crazy would that be, right? So what season do we find ourselves in? Do we find ourselves in a spring? Do we find ourselves in a summer? Do we find ourselves in a winter? Kind of feels, even though it's hot outside, a lot like a winter season to me out there, right? It seems like we find ourselves in the midst of a nation that is in decline, a world that is in decline. Why is that? Is there stuff that we might learn from previous generations, previous seasons, previous birth plans that are applicable to us in our own generation? I espouse to you that there is. From about COVID time until now, I struggled to discern the massive culture shifts which have been occurring since roughly 2008 and have increased in intensity in a great degree that I believe will culminate in the next few years. Trust in our nation, its leaders, and its institutions has been deteriorating year after year after year. Culture wars have re-erupted, rising back up age-old animosities. Many of the things that we're experiencing are not new. I espouse to you that there are old demons at work in our generation causing a repeat performance in a greater state. Think about previous generations that were bad. Think about things like the KKK and the Black Panthers on the opposite side of that. In our generation, you had Black Lives Matter and you had the white boys that were rising up. Half of this stuff is true and half of this stuff is fiction from the devil to try to keep us divided. He wants to keep white people from loving black people. He wants to keep poor people from loving rich people. He wants to keep people who live on this side of the block from loving people on that side of the block. He wants to keep you thinking that you're a Republican or a Democrat so that you could be at war with one another instead of getting things done and walking in unity, right? As believers in Jesus Christ, if we could walk in unity and operate in the kind of voice that we sang about earlier in that song, could you imagine the mountains that would be moved? But the devil wants to stop us from that. We see the rise of woke ideology versus traditional values in our generation. You see rising movements like LGBT that seemingly come out of nowhere to control the discourse of our nation. In my generation, about 2% of people struggled with gender identity issues. In this generation, some 20% of young people struggle with gender identity issues. I espouse to you that that is not a natural phenomenon. I espouse to you that that is a doctrine of demons. That is something that the demonic powers and principalities are doing to try to destroy God's image. In Genesis 1.26, it says, you and I, human beings, are created and formed in the very image of God. Satan hates that, so he wants to destroy marriage. He wants to destroy families. He wants to destroy your identity. He wants to send you into confusion, not knowing who you are. Do you know that demons are androgynous? What do I mean by that? Demons are neither male nor female. So what do you think they want to do when they try to go inhabit or oppress or depress or take over a human being? They want them to be just like them. They don't want them to understand what their identity is. They want to send them into confusion. They want to distort the very image of God. You know, some of the facelift stuff and all that stuff's real good, but have you ever watched some of the Hollywood stars now that look like they're absolute aliens? I think alien invasion has occurred, right? And they want us to accept that's normal? No, demons want to distort the very image of God. It is okay to age gracefully, hallelujah Jesus. You're allowed to age. We don't need to do some of these crazy things that they want us to do in our generation. They want to emasculate the role of men. They call it toxic masculinity. If you preach like you're a normal man, they want to call you toxic nowadays. Things that we once thought of as unfathomable have become a reality. Lockdowns, vax mandates, mask mandates, cancel culture, and more. Political parties hating one another where you can't even have a dialogue with one another anymore, right? Is this really the best our nation has to offer an 80-year-old senile person and another guy affectionately known as the orange man that's under four indictments right now? (laughs) That went over better in first service, but... Think about it for a moment. 
I'm neither Republican nor Democrat standing up here before you. I'm not trying to offend any particular party, but is this really the best our nation has to offer? I love old people. I just praise my 85-year-old grant, my, my 85-year-old father, but 85-year-olds should not be running our nation. He'll even tell you that. Amen. Think about this. This, again, is not a political statement right or left. Um, Diane Feinstein is 90 years old. 90 years old. She literally signed over her rights, like her mental rights to her daughter recently, right, where her daughter is her caretaker that can do it, yet she's still a sitting senator. Come on, man. I mean, like, this stuff is cray-cray, right? I mean, this is some crazy, like, it don't, when it don't make sense, then maybe something more sinister is behind it, right? When it don't make sense, maybe something more sinister is behind it. Why aren't they dealing with the big issues that are really out there? We live in this odd world of dichotomies where you have only fans rising up on one side and hopefully none of you better have no prescription to that thing. At the same time, you have Roe versus Wade being overturned. Our world is divided more than ever before, right? It's a strange time. While all being set to the backdrop of child trafficking, hidden sexual exploits of our leaders, and somehow how they keep hidden that little black book about Pedo Island, I will never understand. I sound like a conspiracy theorist. But, but here's the funny thing of our generation. Conspiracy theories are more real half the time than the stuff that's coming out of mainstream news. That's the insanity of the world that we live in. You don't know what to believe. Why is that? Because the devil is the father of lies. He wants to keep everything a lie. He wants to keep everything hidden. He wants to keep everything from being uncovered. But what is behind all of this madness? I, I, I attest to you that the biblical answer to this question is that we find ourselves in new days, yet dealing with the same old demons. Demons do not die. They only recreate themselves in future generations by inhabiting new hosts. We are very comfortable looking at Old Testament and New Testament theology and looking at the demons of their day, but we don't want to acknowledge the demons of our day. So why don't we take a little bit of a look back at the story of Elijah, which I shared a couple weeks ago, then also a story from Jesus' day, and see if there's any analogies to where we find ourselves in in our day. Elijah's day, he was a voice crying out in the wilderness, calling people under repentance. The leaders in his day were not Barack Obama, were not Joe Biden, were not Donald Trump. They were King Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Now we look at them and we can acknowledge as believers that in their day, they were demon possessed. They were clearly demon possessed. So what was their agenda? What were the things that they did? And are there any similarities to our own generation? They served at a time in a nation whose foundations and pillars were serving and worshiping God, right? The nation of Israel. Our nation, for all its faults, warts, blemishes, was filled formed on a biblical foundation. I think we could all agree to that. Did it diverge from it? Yes, and it needs help just like every nation does. Ahab and Jezebel were possessed by powerful demonic forces that were meant to lead the nation of Israel astray. They tore down their temples and places of true worship. If they were alive today, they would be championing the closing of churches during COVID, right? They wanted to silence the voice of the church, so they closed them down. They killed, or to use a modern-day version, canceled out the voices that were prophetic in nature. She killed the churches. She killed the pastors. She killed the priests. She silenced them. Anyone that would go against the agenda that she had set forth would be silent. She replaced them with 850 false pastors, prophets, and priests that were under her dominion. Scary to think about, but draw the analogies to today. You know, Mary Jo and I are driving in today and we're like, why do we lament sometimes that some of the, the seemingly largest churches that maybe are not preaching sound doctrine, I don't want to go too crazy with that, but it says in the last days, people will go for messages that tickle their ears, 
that they will seek out pastors and churches who do not confront them, who do not call them to repentance. They would have these false prophet liars instead of prophesiers that are the same kind of pastors and priesters that, that Jezebel put into office in her day. She put 850 of them into office in that day. And we see it in our own generation. There's some crazy stuff going on in the pulpits, right? She erected Asherin poles that were actually phallic symbols and tore down the old symbols that were religious in nature, that were healthy religious in nature, so to speak, right? Do you know those same symbols actually are in most prominent cities in our generation? If you go to Washington, D.C., that one monument that's the tall, straight one there, you go to, the, to, to Italy and Rome where you go to the center where the Catholic Church is actually located. There's that circular uh, uh, hallway that is right out there. There's a, basically a large Asher and pole that's sitting right there. We still have them in our own generation. She tore down the godly religious symbols and replaced them with things that were acts of worship unto Baal. She would have her men who served alongside of her castrated as they would serve for her. She would turn them into transgendered individuals. At the same time, she was incredibly sexual and used her sexual prowess to go seek out and use that to control men. So the only place she wanted a man to be a man was in the bed. But she proliferated sexual sin in her generation because the demonic powers that were behind her. Do you see it at work in our own generation yet? Can you start to draw the parallels? She surrounded herself with eunuchs. All the while, her husband Ahab sat passively by a neutered man controlled by demons wearing skinny jeans. I am joking. I can't wear skinny jeans anymore. (laughs) By the way, their son was so evil and doing such crazy things that I espoused to you that it might even make Hunter Biden blush in our generation. And God ended up killing him. You see, the people of that day were faced with the same multiplied sins that we're experiencing in our generation. They didn't call it the LGBT movement, but they celebrated sex, gender mutilation, androgyny, and wore it with pride. In our generation, they're going after chemically castrating six-year-old kids. Tell me that is not doctrines of demons. They overtly worship Baal, yet we do the same. Instead of going to a temple, we go to bars, we go to strip clubs, we go to online porn, we visit OnlyFans, and our young people boast of their body counts. The leading cause of death in America, even during COVID, was actually abortion. Our abortion clinics have become the altars of Baal. We're doing nothing different than they did in their own generation. Those old demonic powers and principalities have been released in mass in recent years because it says before the coming of the Lord that these things are going to be on the increase. The birth pangs are going to get bigger and badder and worse, and we probably haven't seen the worst of it yet. So we need to be able to stand in the midst of that. What did Elijah do? He didn't stand for it. He publicly called out sins of of Ahab and Jezebel. He made a public display of their false prophets asking God to call down fire, and he did. He killed those 850 false prophets of Baal right there in an instant. And you would think that Ahab, or you would think that uh, Elijah, after that great victory, would be fired up, would be excited. But let me tell you something. One thing that you need to understand about demons is that they never tire. They never go to sleep. They're always there. They're always after you. Our war is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and heavenly places. But they will use all of their energy to wear you out, even if you are the strongest prophet. After his great victory, you'll remember he went into hiding. He actually started to fear them. He just saw God take out 850 of her false prophets, and then he's still running from Jezebel. 
These demons are real. These demons are powerful. They do not sleep even in our own generation, but we should not give them voice to stand. Ultimately, God revived him and took him away in a throne and a chariot of fire, took him to heaven where he is sitting there with God, hanging out. He showed back up in Jesus' day for a few moments, and guess what? The Bible says that in the book of Revelation, he will be one of the prophets that's standing there at the walls of Jerusalem, still calling people out, still preaching the good news, still calling people under repentance of which he will die an earthly death but God will raise him again three days later and then he'll go to be with God in heaven for all eternity these stories we are reading are real hallelujah same demons different day what also happened in Jesus day what happened in his day the backdrop to his coming was not too dissimilar to our day or to Elijah's day The Roman Empire was the ruling power. If you draw some analogies to us in the United States, um, what ended up happening to them is it would fall to utter degeneracy, sexual immorality, wars and rumors of wars, extending their dominion to all the ends of the earth, having to devalue their currency to pay for bills because they couldn't afford them. The nation ended up collapsing under the weight of their sin and anyone who would call out their sin, they would kill or cancel. Does it sound a little bit like the generation we're starting to live in today? Hope I made the case. There comes an amazing season in the life of Jesus in the New Testament where he confronts the demons who he faced in his day. Mark 5, 1 is perhaps one of the most famous stories. It's the story of the demons called Legion. It says this, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with him with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The dude was hanging out in the cemetery, and he was possessed by a demon. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but before he he tore the chains apart and broke the irons with his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day in the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. If you're starting to look for demonic activity in the life of people, why do you think people cut themselves with stones and knives and cutting, right? Because they're trying to mutilate and disfigure the very image of God. The devil wants to do that at every single turn, right? When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell at his knees in front of them. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what's your name? And he says, my name is Legion. He replied, for we are many. I espouse to you that legion has been released in our own generation. And he begged Jesus again not to send him out of the area. There's geographical power and presence that we preached on before as well. A large herd of pigs was feeding on him on in the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into him. He gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down a steep bank and into a lake and were drowned. Those tending to the pigs ran off and reported it to the towns in the countryside. The people went out to see what would happen. When they came and saw Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. How crazy of a response is that? They see a man be set free, and instead of embracing it, instead of saying, would you free more of us? Would you heal us? Would you deliver us? Would you set our generation free? Would you give us a path to freedom, oh God? They're like, would you please get up out of here? We want to stay with our demons. It says in Scripture that in the end days, the love of many will wax cold. We're going to see the same kind of things happen. If you preach truth, they're going to want to cast you out instead of embracing you in. They want to keep sleeping with their demons. They don't want to let go of them. They're more comfortable being bound in their strongholds than they are being free. We see it happening. You go out there, now they're starting to arrest people for preaching on the streets. 
People want their demons. They love them. They coddle them instead of casting them out in the mighty name of Jesus. The culture was so corrupt that instead of rejoicing, they asked Jesus to leave. So where does that leave us? Let's go back to our questions from the beginning. Let's go back to what Franklin Delano Roosevelt said. There is a mysterious cycle in human events. To some generations, much is given. Of other generations, much is expected. This generation has a rendezvous with destiny. I believe, Journey Church, this generation, the one that we find ourselves in, has a rendezvous with destiny. I believe the next 10 years are going to be paramount. I believe we ain't seen nothing yet. As crazy as that sounds, with all that we've been through, with all the hate speech that's going on, with all the people hating on one another, with all the lockdowns, with all that we've seen, what if that is just a type and a shadow of what is yet to come? Because it says before Jesus comes back, it's going to get worse before it gets better, right? So I stand on good ground in sharing that with you. So we need to be prepared. We need to be fired up. We need to be spiritually fit. We need to be physically fit. We need to be ready for the battle that lies ahead in the name of Jesus. Matthew 24, 8 describes the birth pangs that we find ourselves in. They get worse and worse and worse before the coming of the day of the Lord. We live in a day and age where I've already made the case that old demons have been released in accelerating ways and we're seeing it, we're experiencing it on an everyday basis. A day in which many will fall away. That means believers in Jesus Christ, you've heard seemingly new words like deconstructing my faith. These are things that you didn't hear of 10 years ago. There's people that are now deconstructing their faith. That's an apostasy. They're falling away from what they once believed. These are the days that we live in. We live in the days of Elijah in our generation. Many will succumb to doctrines of demons. Brothers and sisters who you love very dearly will succumb to doctrines of demons and reach out for messages that tickle their very ears. But it'll also be a day and age where God will rise up Elijah's and John the Baptist and people who will call others under repentance. See, Elijah torched the followers of Baal. Jesus died, descended into hell, defeated hell, death, and the grave, for the first time in history cast out demons, demonstrating his power over hell, death, and the grave, healed the sick, delivered those who needed to be delivered, and guess what? Scripture tells us that that is a ministry that he would pass on as a sign to all who would believe that in my name you will cast out demons, you will heal the sick, you will preach the good news of the gospel and see people come to repentance if we will only walk in it the devil wants to silence your voice don't let him silence your voice church the ministry of deliverance is being rediscovered in this last generation I believe in a new way because Jesus is getting close to returning while we can't kill these demons we can certainly cast them out and then we could work on things like inner healing and other stuff to get people healed up, sealed up, and get back in the game. Amen? Amen. Yes. So if we truly do live in the midst of a cosmic battle for good and evil that is reaching a crescendo, what are we as believers to do? I think it's first and foremost, we need to understand how to get personal deliverance so that we can move forward in health and healing so that we could be of use to others. So what I want to share with you today is four or five steps to personal deliverance that will help you be ready to go out there and make a difference in the lives of others. The first thing we need to do, Scripture tells us, is confess. Romans 10.9 says, believe if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Guess what? Those demons in Legion knew that Jesus was Jesus. Even the demons know that Jesus is de Jesus, right? But will you submit yourself to him? Will you confess yourself, your sins to him? Will you confess even right now if God starts to bring some things to your mind of those habitual sins that continue to plague you? What are the things that you can't seemingly get over on your own and you're a believer in Jesus Christ? You're like, why can't I defeat that? Maybe it's not you. Maybe it's a demon at work in you trying to keep you from the calling that God has in you. Can Christians have demons? Yes, Christians can have demons. 
They may not be able to own you or possess you, if you want to get technical about that word, because you were owned by the Holy Spirit. But if you open up doors in your life that give them legal grounds to be at work in your life, they will come in really quickly and start to harass you, to oppress you, to do everything they can to keep you from your calling. So the first thing you need to do is confess. Is there sexual sins that you had in your life? Have you committed abortion? Do you walk around in anger? Are you walking around in addiction? What strongholds are there in your life that you haven't been able to overcome? God wants to deliver you those today, but you first have to admit that you got a problem. Lord, I have a problem. I need your help. I confess. Lord, would you save me? Lord, would you deliver me? And then you need to cancel those things out through spiritual warfare. It says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by testing that you might discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Having confessed your sins, you need to cancel out any legal grounds that you've given to the enemy. Yes, Lord, I've opened the door. I've been on OnlyFans, whatever it might be. I'm throwing that out there. But whatever your thing is that you've been doing on a habitual basis, would you go out there and say, Lord, I confess. Lord, I cancel out those thoughts. I cancel out the greed that's been in my life. I cancel out the sexual sins that have been in my life. I cancel out abortion. I cancel out gluttony. I cancel out addiction. I cancel out anger. I no longer give it any grounds in my life. Lord, if I've opened up those doors, I cancel them right now in the name of Jesus because your blood covers up all sin your word says that if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth then your blood will cover me I am declared not guilty in a court of law you have no right over me any longer devil and then you need to do like that song we sang earlier and begin to command the devils out Mark 16, 17, in his name, they shall cast out demons. In Jesus' name, being bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, being covered in his blood, my sins are forgiven. You have no more legal grounds. I cancel you out, and like Jesus did, I command you to go into the abyss. If there's a herd of pigs outside, send them out there. If there's a herd of ducks outside, send them out there. Whatever you got to do. You have no right over my life anymore. And demons, I command you to go in the name of Jesus Christ. These are the words you need to be using, Christians. Don't let the devil get an upper hand on you. You are not defeated. Don't let him lie to you anymore. You are now in control in the name of Jesus Christ. We close the doors. Holy Spirit, we invite you in. Would you fill all the dark places? We commit is the next word that I would give you. We commit that from this day forward, we will serve you and you alone. We stand with our families in Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Devil, you have no more grounds. We're going to serve you for the rest of our days. There is no room for you to get back in in Jesus' name. Finally, the last one I would say is commission. Go into all the world. Mark 5, 18, the conclusion of that story with Jesus and Legion. says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Journey Church, this is not church for us. This is church for people who are not here yet. We love that you come each and every week. We love that you come and get your God goosebumps. We love that you come and prophesy. We love that you come and pray. We love that you're excited. But man, it is incomplete if we don't understand that we're in a war and that hell is hot and it goes on for a long time and that we don't want our brothers and sisters to go there. We need to be out there going and changing the world by sharing our testimony, by inviting people to church, by sharing the good news of the gospel with them wherever we find ourselves, at work, online, in our neighborhood, wherever you're at. We need to be about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Would you rise with me as we bring this service to a close?